the foreground of the book is matter it consists of matters like what did augustine do with the tension between gospel poverty and the need to uh, to have money and how did aquinas thomas aquinas encapsulate and summarize the eight centuries of thinking about private property rights that went before him and what how does luther's understanding of the lord's supper theology of the lord's supper undergird his political theology of redistribution through taxation those that's the real story hello everyone this is justin Laterell at the center for the study of law and religion at emory university uh, today I'm speaking with Dr. Alan Calhoun, the author of a new book that was just published by Rutledge entitled Tax Law, Religion, and Justice. Dr. Calhoun is a McDonald Distinguished Fellow in Law and Religion. He has an LLM in Taxation and a PhD in Theological Ethics. He's worked extensively in both tax law and legal editing, and his research focuses on ethics, tax theory, and legal history. Alan, congratulations on your new book, and thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me, Justin. It's great to be here. All right. I wonder if you could just start by telling us um, what the book's about and why did you write it? Well, it started as sort of a conceptual archaeological dig, if that makes any sense. During my years as a practicing tax attorney and um, legal writer, editor, I, I began to wonder what lies behind the um, uh, multi-directional way in which tax theory and tax policy moves, particularly in the United States. On the one hand, often we discuss tax policy uh, as if tax were a necessary evil and that the whole goal of tax policy is to find um, the, the ways of raising necessary revenue to keep the government doing whatever we think it should do without impacting the economy more than absolutely necessary because we are committed above all else to economic growth. But then on the other hand, sometimes tax policy surfaces as um, a means to achieving uh, real positive affirmative ethical goals and commitments, or at least reflecting our society's um, ethical goals and commitments. And, um, so that's why I wanted to look at what's happened in the past 2000 years of theological reflection, particularly as it bears on taxation. Um, what I discovered when I, when I started getting into the research is that tax is kind of a uh, a flashpoint in the history of Western theology because it implicates the all-consuming political, theological, or economic theological question of property and property rights. And property is a central moral issue for theologians throughout the past 2,000 years in the Christian tradition, and I'm sure in other religious traditions as well. A central concept because it's the point at which um, the, the, the embrace of poverty that's, that we seem to see in the Gospels, particularly in, in the life of Jesus and his, his disciples, runs into tension with the fact that people need things and money to live. Um, so you've got this, this exalted view of poverty in the Christian tradition from the very beginning in tension with something that we could call realism, the fact that we've got to have an economy and, and things to survive. That tension that taxation actually mediates in theology then got transferred out of theology into a secular realm in which it can mediate between what we now call efficiency and equity. And that's what the book is about. The book is about the underlying tension and the way tax resolved that underlying tension in historical theology so that we can better understand how tax can resolve our own tensions, which are not expressed in theological terms, but I strongly believe are inherited theological categories just expressed in, in secular terms now. 
It sounds, it sounds really fascinating. Um, and I think it's, it's rare to find somebody who's an expert in both tax law and theological ethics. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to reading this. Who do you see as the main audience for your book? And what might um, other non-specialists or, or just people in the public find most interesting about the book? Uh, I say in the book that it's written for three audiences, historians, policymakers, and the church. The foreground of the book is matter, it consists of matters like what did Augustine do with the tension between gospel poverty and the need to, uh, to have money? And how did Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, encapsulate and summarize the eight centuries of thinking about private property rights that went before him? And what, how does Luther's understanding of the Lord's Supper, theology of the Lord's Supper, undergird his political theology of redistribution through taxation? Those, that's the real story. So what I think the book offers to uh, non-specialists, more than, and even specialists for that matter, more than anything else, is um, a, just a really interesting story, a really interesting story about how we got where we are and how perhaps we can think about um, issues that confront us now in 2021 in Washington, D.C. and in London and other capitals in a new, fresh, and human way. Um, what's the best way for people to access this book? It's available on the Routledge site. It's actually part of the uh, Routledge series called Law and Religion. It is available on their site, both in the in the hardback form and in Kindle form. Uh, Kindle Kindle might provide a much more uh, much easier option for a lot of a lot of interested readers. Uh, those two options are also available on Amazon, and of course, um, the best way is probably to ask your institution's library to buy a copy. Um, I hope people do that. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Alan, and congratulations again on the book. Thanks so much, Justin.